Spirit. Amen. One of the many famous sayings of St. Anthony the Great, which I know all of you have heard, but I want you to hear it again. The Abba Anthony says that our life and our death is in our neighbor, and that we Our life and our death is in our neighbor. And he says that those who gain their neighbor have gained God, and those who scandalize their neighbor have lost Christ. This is important, very important, obviously, because we cannot love God whom we have not seen, as we know we are told by John, and we cannot love our neighbor who is standing right in front of our face. Because that is the measure. Do we see Christ in that person? And St. Paul, in his epistle today, to the Romans, gives us, of course, many guidelines for proper Christian behavior. There's more than morality. is that way of life which opens our hearts to the grace of God. And he says, We who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. That each of us, he says, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, for even Christ did not please himself. But as is written in the scriptures, the reproaches of those that fell upon me have fallen upon me. Which is, of course, from Psalm 68, that last verse. So, it's a big step for us, a big thing in our life, that we are not to consider ourselves in every moment of life. There are moments, of course, to protect ourselves where we have to. But in general, we are seeking to please our neighbor, to give way, to humble ourselves before the presence of our neighbor, to find God in them, and to lift them up. As I said about Abba Makarios last week, when Abba Makarios spoke the good word to the pagan priest, and the pagan priest was converted, the previous monk who had spoke harshly to him was beaten half to death on the road. So the good word helped. We are to please our neighbor, to seek their edification, to work what is good for them, do what is good, not just whatever pleases them, of course, but what is to good, leading to edification. That second verse is rather important, because there's a lot of things people want that aren't for their good and aren't for their edification. The alcoholic asks me for the bottle of booze, I'm not going to give it to him. Just one example. So we must do what is for their good, and follow the example of Christ, who, as we know in Philippians, took on the form of a servant, it says, a bondservant, humbling himself to death, being obedient even to death on the cross. We must follow that example. And those reproaches that fall upon God, that fall upon each of us, are the ones that he bore upon the cross. We are filled with this in the lives of the saints, of course. We think, of course, of uh, St. John, Maximovich, we preached about a few weeks ago, when St. John always, it didn't matter what hour of the day it was, was going around the city helping his community, traveling across the globe to help his community. The famous story of when the, he calls up the priest at 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, who was in another country, who was worrying about his parish, being able to pay the bills, and he says, well, staying up worrying about it won't help. Go to bed. He hadn't told him this. A real pastor, in the greatest sense, who really bore the infirmities of his priests and his people. You know the stories of St. Nectarios, who remember when the young man in the school got into a fight that he was the administrator of. He brought them to his office. Of course, they were terrified. They're going before the bishop. The bishop weeps and says that he's going to take on a three-day total fast so that they can correct themselves because he had failed them. This is a pastor. This is the same bishop who people were mortified by when they found out that he was cleaning toilets so the janitor wouldn't lose his job at night because the janitor was sick. A true bishop, a true shepherd, one that we should seek to emulate. This is the example we are given. And every one of us Christians, there are no Lone Ranger Christians. We are all saved in community. Even the hermits, St. Anthony, was saved by praying for the salvation of the world. And believe me, he wept for the world. And Siloam the Athenite stayed up every night weeping over the status of the world. 
even though hardly anyone knew who he was until Father Sophroni told us of his existence. In St. Silouan, of course, the famous prayer he has is, I pray thee, O merciful Lord, for all the peoples of the earth, they may come to know thee by the power of the Holy Spirit. Other than the Jesus prayer, this was his frequent prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and save thy world. Frequently he would cry upon thee to save the world. He was so concerned about his neighbor. He was so concerned about the disasters he sees around him. He wasn't, you know, sitting there looking at the news every morning to be titillated by what was going on so he could talk about something else bad that was going on, something else bad someone else had done, to gossip about his neighbor, God forbid. And that's what we want to do so often. Is how I guess if you hear what such and such was doing in the church, or such and such was doing in politics, that idiot, what were they thinking? Dare us when we have such tremendous sins ourselves, I being the first. And so we must seek what is for the best of everyone. Now that's a high calling because when we please one individual, we might not please a group around them. So you're not going to win a lot of fans necessarily doing this. You're not going to get a lot of thumbs up. Those I've told which they say you get, I don't know. I don't do these things. But you must seek what's good for everyone. It's like when we come into church. While we might want to talk to someone, we might want to consider that the other 50 people want to pray. So we're being obtrusive in that other person's life. But we might want to go into the hall and scream. You might want to consider that some people have just received Holy Communion. You might want to preserve that for balance, measure, moderation, sobriety must be in our spiritual lives. When someone calls us up and interrupts our prayers, if they need us, answer the phone. And get back to the prayers. Because that person needs you. Now don't just answer it for the telemarketer. You've got to forgive that too. You know when it's there, well as I do. I always hear people tell me, those darn telemarketers call me. I tell them I haven't answered one in years. I don't know how you do that. Because we have that wonderful thing called call ID. Use it. Help your neighbor. Help your brother. Look for Christ. It's amazing how the world around you transforms when you stop seeing the quirks of people, that strange looking man in the cask and the beard, the strange other people. When you start to look for Jesus in that person, oh, there's Jesus. Where's Jesus in that one? When you start to look for Jesus, even the strangest of people start to shine. Because underneath all that is the image and likeness of God. There might be a lot of falseness on the surface. There might be a lot of darkness on the surface, which does need amending. But somewhere deep down in there, there is still the presence of Christ. And Christ loves that person far more than we do. Christ loves us far more than we love ourselves. Christ loves our families. We worry about everything. But Christ came to please us and bore our reproaches and healed our disease and took on the form of a servant. We who would be first should be the servant of all, the slave of all. But when you see all these people around you in church, as I've said many times, pick a different table one day. Sit by the different people and get to know who those people are. There's some beautiful people that I'm sure some of you don't even know. Maybe I don't know as well as I should. We must seek to love our neighbor. Because if we can't love Quite clearly, as St. John tells us, the neighbor in front of our face, we cannot love God. God is a big abstraction to us. God becomes concrete in his creation, the people around us. God loves the body as well. That person in front of us, that concrete individual, has to be that person we look for Christ in. So we who are strong need to bear the infirmities of the weak, to suffer with them, to rejoice with them, to be with them, and to be truly Christ-like and do with that, because we try to lead, of course, to their edification. And their edification is not whatever they want, it's the kingdom of heaven. It's the presence of Christ. We need to be Christ to our neighbor, so that they might see Christ and come to know him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.